it's, it's great to be with you. And I have to say, this is impressive to have 700 or 800 people gather on a Thursday morning, well, actually a beautiful Thursday morning in my view. I'm from Seattle and we don't have a lot of sunny days. If this were Seattle, no one would be here except the speakers probably. But and, you know, what's impressive is not only that you all come, that you, but that you've come to talk about an economic topic. Um, I, talk, I spend most of my time talking about actually the, the title of this conference, sort of making the moral case for free enterprise. But I discovered early on that if I lead with the word economics, that had a way of sort of suppressing interest. And I finally realized, well, the reason is because most people, if they've gone to college and have done any, had any interaction with economics, they took that macro course and maybe the micro course. Uh, and then they basically said, okay, well, uh, I definitely don't want to be an economist. That stuff's deadly, right? And I'm, I'm now convinced that many times those courses are actually designed to alienate 99% of the population from economics. Um, because we end up thinking it's this sort of purely mathematical enterprise, and we don't realize how interesting and exciting it is. Economics at bottom is about us. It's about how human beings uh, trade and distribute and create goods and services and information in a context of scarcity. And because it's about us and our interactions, it's interesting, just as human beings are interesting, but that's often lost sight of in the kind of technical discipline of economics. And I myself was actually a, 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 a recipient and in some ways a victim of this as a, as a college freshman uh, in the 1980s. So this is prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union. I had grown up in Amarillo, Texas, and went off to a small, very liberal, liberal arts college about 500 miles away. In my freshman year, I found myself in a political science course in which I was reading the Communist Manifesto, as well as a, a, a book by an American socialist named Michael Parenti. Well, the professor, I thought, said, if you read these books five times through, you'll get an A automatically. Well, the Communist Manifesto is not very thick. You know, you can read it in about an hour. So I thought, well, this will be easy. So I read it five times that semester, and I look back at it now, and almost every line was highlighted. As a result of this, because I remember I, I was a complete economic simpleton. I knew nothing about economics. Uh, I had kind of a, a vaguely Christian worldview. I was a Christian, not sort of well-developed intellectually, uh, but I had basic Christian moral intuitions that we ought to be concerned about the poor and the, uh, the, the orphan and the widow, that as Christians, God cares about the poor, the widow, and the orphan, and we ought to as well. What I found in the Communist Manifesto and the Socialist Textbook was a lot of talk about the poor and lifting up the poor out of poverty and the equality of all human beings. And as a Christian, I said, oh, absolutely, we're, we're equal. We're all equal, at least in some sense, because we're made it all in the image of God. And so by the end of my first semester of my freshman year, I was convinced that if you wanted to be a Christian consistently, you needed to be something like a socialist. Now, I obviously kind of modified socialism uh, in a Christian context, especially in a school where I was, it's kind of a Protestant liberalism sort of environment. It was easy to shave off the rough kind of atheistic edges of Marxism. And so you imagine socialism as just this wonderful society in which goods and services are distributed equally because everyone else is equal, and that sounds wonderful. Well, that was sort of my freshman year. I was blessed to have courses that sort of exposed me to different thinkers. And I actually took a course on Marxism in which the professor, he was a, a you know, kind of lone conservative who didn't get tenure, incidentally, but he was there at the time. Uh, he, he assigned a book by Thomas Sowell, the American economist, on Marxism. And if you read the book, it, I don't know if it's still in print. It's very good, but it's purely descriptive. You, when you read it, you'd say, there's nothing partisan about this. And, uh, it helped me understand the sort of Mar Marxist ideas better than any other book I'd read. But because Sol was so enlightening and clear, I looked around for other stuff that he had read. And it turns out he's a very strong advocate of the free enterprise system against the kind of socialist ideas that I was entertaining at the time. And because of that, uh, that sort of led me to National Review magazine. And I eventually, by about my junior year, was reading The Road to Serfdom by, by Friedrich Hayek. The sort of, uh, seminal text of, of 20th century free market economics. And so the, what was the result of this? Well, the result that was by my senior year for sure, 
I was convinced that free enterprise, or what you know, you could call capitalism, but that that word has baggage. Let's say free enterprise is the best system of the live alternatives for doing what you want an economic system to do, for lifting people out of poverty, for alleviating and eradicating, in many cases, absolute poverty, in which. Famine never happens. You might still have people at the bottom of the economic ladder that have some food insecurity, but in countries that enjoy real economic freedom over the long term, those countries don't have famines. They don't have mass starvation. And there's only one economic system we've ever discovered that does that, and it's free enterprise. Uh, well, this was 1989, 1988, by the time I uh, sort of came around to this way of thinking, but I had one problem. My senior year, I had read a book by Ayn Rand called Atlas Shrugged. And in fact, I'd read a book prior to that in another class uh, called The Virtue of Selfishness. All right, now this was a problem because Rand is in probably the most widely read defender of the free economy in the 20th century. Any of you that know her know that she was, her genius was to uh, dignify and in many ways lionize the entrepreneur. She understood the heroic qualities of entrepreneurship and far more than any novelist that I can imagine. In fact, if you want to realize how rare that is, try to think of a movie you've seen in which a businessman, as a businessman, has been defended and sort of shown in a positive light. Batman doesn't count, right? Uh, Bruce, Bruce Wayne, yeah, he inherited a bunch of money, but his her heroicism is with Batman. You find that it's very few and far between, and yet it's the creative ingenuity and risk-taking of entrepreneurs that is the activity that creates wealth primarily in a market economy. So Rand got that. The problem is she was a very hardcore atheist. Do I, I'm convinced in part to the fact that she met a lot of pastors and priests who were socialists, and she got the idea in her head that Christianity and socialism were sort of a, a two peas in a pod, and in fact, socialism was the result of what she, this Christian idea of altruism. Now, altruism, it really means helping or doing something on behalf of another. It's from the, the Latin word alter, which means other. But she understood altruism as always sacrificing uh, in, in your own interests for the other person. And so she absolutely despised Christianity. And she said, uh, in fact, altruism and capitalism are incompatible. They're philosophical opposites. So, you know, I had a dilemma because, of course, as Christians, greed or selfishness, that's one of the seven deadly sins. It's, if anything, it's sort of a, a form of idolatry. It's certainly not a virtue. And if Ayn was right, it's, Ayn Rand was right, it seemed as if capitalism or free enterprise was actually based on greed and selfishness. Now, this is a problem. I certainly, if you're a Christian, this would be a problem. If the essence of capitalism were greed, I don't think that we could affirm that economic system because it's based on something that we consider to be an evil. Well, the problem is, is this, and so I had a kind of intellectual dilemma because I thought, okay, free enterprise makes the most sense economically, but it was still morally troubling. I was blessed enough, I went off to, to seminary and to graduate school and kept struggling with this. I uh, finally found a book by George Gilder, who's now a friend and colleague, a book called Wealth and Poverty that was just released, and another great book by Michael Novak called The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. And these two books first sort of gave me a sense of how someone could be sort of fully a, a Christian in the robust sense. That is a, a well-developed worldview and an, an ability to apply the Christian worldview to the, the issues of the day and also defend the free economy. And what I realized is that Rand, for all of her partial insights, got the basic reality of free enterprise wrong. Uh, the entrepreneur, the successful entrepreneur in a free economy, is not the greedy person that hoards his wealth, right? Like the dragon Smaug in The Hobbit who clutches all of his wealth in a cave or hides it in a mattress and counts it. That's the miser, the greedy miser that you see usually in the background in scriptural warnings about wealth. The entrepreneur is exactly the opposite. The entrepreneur is a person who takes his wealth and rather than hoarding it with, sort of, with security, he puts it at risk. He casts his bread upon the waters in pursuit of a vision that may or may not pay off. And what he's often doing, if he's successful or she's successful, is anticipating the wants and the needs of people prior to them even knowing they want it. Think of the iPhone. 30 years ago, those of you that are over 30, um, were you sitting around saying, man, I would love to have a smartphone that you know, could connect to the internet, I could do some video talking. No, we didn't have any idea about this. So it wasn't like there was a pre-existing explicit need. 
But the inventors and the, the people that brought these things to fruition, they sort of anticipated the possibility of a market that if this thing existed, it would meet human needs and a lot of people would like it. Well, whatever that is, that's not greed according to the traditional definition, which we see in a miser. And that's the essence of the free enterprise system. And so it's, that's a morally robust idea. And so I, I sort of resolved this to my own intellectual satisfaction in about 1991 or 92. And so you know what happened there between 89 and 91 is the Soviet Union collapsed. And it, it, the sort of disrepute of communism was so great that the Democratic candidate uh, for president, Bill Clinton, talked up the virtues of the free market and the free economy. Um, the, uh, Pope John Paul II in 1991 wrote a famous encyclical in which he affirmed capitalism according to the, dif the proper definition of rule of law in a market economy and economic freedom. So this was a moment in which I thought, okay, the 20th century was sort of a test case in which the human race were the subjects of a test. And, and the, the, two sort of sub the two groups, one group was subjected to a more or less free economy, like we uh, certainly had at the time in the United States, and then a command economy in which a centralized government dictates everything from prices to uh, quotas and, and sort of production details, the kinds of things that lead to those crazy pictures from Poland that, uh, that Gary showed us a minute ago, and we know that it doesn't work. And so I thought, okay, that's one experiment, uh, one question that we can sort of lay to rest. Clearly, if the, you know, the choices are capitalism, that is free market capitalism on the one hand, and communism on the other hand, capitalism won, communism lost, end of story. Let's talk about something else, right? And so I did that, actually, myself. I was interested in the kind of interconnection of Christian theology and, and other disciplines and spent several years writing really on faith and science things and talking about the evidence from the natural world that, seem, that suggests the universe exists for a purpose. As a result, I find myself on college campuses and a lot of Christian college campuses. And what I found, you know, we're talking 2001, 2002, was that the same economic ideas I had in 1985 were alive and well in a, the vast majority of college students at Christian colleges at the beginning of the 21st century. And I had I experienced this enough that I realized that the case for freedom has to be made anew to every generation because the sort of moral intuitions that people have are often satisfied by the socialist ideal. And they make sense as long as you connect your moral assumptions and your moral intuitions to bad economic assumptions. And so I initially thought, well, you know, this is frustrating and it sort of drove me crazy and I thought, I'm constantly getting all these sort of strange objections from college students that what you would think of uh, as conservative Christian colleges. CCU incidentally even now is very much the exception. There are not a lot of even Christian colleges and conservative Christian colleges where the case for free enterprise is more widely felt. But I thought, you know, I've got to do something about this. And so honestly, I got into this subject uh, out of frustration more than anything else because I was convinced that, look, as Christians, we need to be concerned about our fellow human beings. If we're worried about the poor in developing countries, what we want to do is help them to implement the institutions and the laws and the things that allowed us to become wealthy. And what, what was that? Well, it's a free economy. And so that's what we ought to be doing. And so it seemed like a natural expression of the Christian worldview was that we want to refine the economic system that most lifts human beings and most respects human dignity. Um, and so at first I thought, I, this is difficult though because people have a thousand sort of intellectual objections. But it slowly dawned on me that most of the objections that these college students had were not the result of having sort of bad moral intuitions. They were the result, as I mentioned a minute ago, of tying their moral convictions to misunderstandings of the nature of wealth and poverty in economics and certainly free enterprise. And so when you do that, what happens is it distorts your, just your moral evaluation of the system itself. And so in this book, Money, Green, God, this is sort of the, the book that uh, you know, this, this project initially led to, I developed these eight so-called myths, and I describe these as the eight primary myths or intellectual roadblocks, misconceptions that people have when they're thinking about economic issues. And my argument is this, that even if you don't ever study economics, if you learn to recognize and identify these myths, you will be able to see your way through and think clearly 
and apply your moral intuitions to, to economic questions at least 95% of the time. That's how big these impediments are. And so this is, you know, obviously if I'm going to argue that we have some kind of moral uh, duty as Christians if we're acting in the public square to know something about economics, right, that'd be worrisome, wouldn't it, if uh, you had, everybody had to go get a PhD from the University of Chicago in economics, right? That, that'd be tough, but that's not actually what we need to do. And so I want to just give you sort of three examples today uh, of these myths. If you're interested, these are in the book. There are also a lot of stuff about it free online. Uh, I just want to give you an idea of what these myths are. Um, and to, to describe this, I mean, the book is about uh, overcoming the moral objections to free enterprise. And though I don't put it this way in the book, here's how I think we should understand our goal, certainly as people of faith. Our goal is true ethics with good economics. Economics at its best can tell us what will happen given some particular action. What will happen to the city of Denver if the city council imposes rent control on apartment complexes? Economics can tell us with a fair degree of certainty what will happen. Economics as such can't tell us what we ought to do. Right? What we ought to do is a moral question. But very often we have no idea what we ought to do in the economic realm unless we know something about economics, because we don't actually know what will happen. And so what we need, ultimately, is an integration of what I call the descriptive truths and the theoretical insights of economics with the normative principles of ethics, and I would add other uh, important theological truths, like the fact that we're created in the image of God. We want to integrate these things. And so what this means is that there are going to be things we learn from theology, we're going to be things that we learn from scripture uh, that you wouldn't learn just studying economics. At the same time, there are things that you wouldn't learn directly from scripture if you did, hadn't studied economics. In the same way is that, you know, the chemistry or the periodic table, that's not anywhere in the Bible. It's something that's a part of God's world that he's created and he left it up to us to discover it. The economic realm is the same way. Uh, of course, the economic realm is different from physics or chemistry, but it has its own internal logic, its own causal properties that we can discover. And so apart from all the kind of uh, ideological and economic ideologies that you see battling in Washington, D.C., sure, there's a lot of that. But beneath that, there are some core truths that we know to be true and that we can explain why they will be. So for instance, the rent control question, we know uh, without a doubt that rent control to keep housing affordable for lower income people will in fact uh, create a shortage in precisely that area. We can explain economically why that is. Those are things that I would argue we are morally obligated to know and to integrate into our sort of understanding of how we apply our faith in the public square. And so that might sound daunting, again, if you think of economics as this uh, you know, sort of highly technical discipline. But in fact, uh, I'm talking more about what Henry Hazlitt called the art of economics. Uh, one of my first and probably the most important myth I talk about in Money, Greed, and God is what I call the piety myth. And the piety myth is essentially focusing on the state of your heart rather than on the effects of your actions. Now this, this actually makes sense. If you're a Christian, you know that morally why you do something and what you do are both important to God. Right? That's why the widow's mite was important, not because it was economically significant, but because she gave out of her poverty. That's true. There's a unity of the sort of internal and external in the moral life. But in the economic life, a policy is going to have the same effects, whatever the motives of the legislator or the president that supported the policy. In fact, you could have a bill that passes in Congress unanimously, 535 votes, both Senate and House, signed by the president. They could all have a different motive for signing the bill, you're still gonna get the same effect. And this insight, it's, it's so simple, it's easy to get, it's also easy to forget, that we don't want to confuse intentions, especially good moral intentions, with consequences and effects of policies and especially unintended consequences. Here's how Hazlitt puts it in this great book, Economics in One Lesson. He said, the art of economics consists and looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. 
Now he's talking about the art of economics, and you can think of the art here as it's, a, it's like a craft or something that you learn to do as a part of your sort of intuition, right? If you're an artistic person, uh, it's, you don't constantly think about the rules of art or the rules of form. You've embedded them into your very being and your bones, and so you sort of naturally and intuitively exercise this. Hazlitt's argument is that you can do this with the art of economics. That is, if you can simply learn to ask and answer this question, you will have mastered the art of economics. And here's the question. And then what will happen? Right? Now, this is not rocket science, right? But if you can learn, no matter what somebody says, right, if somebody says, let's raise the minimum wage at the federal level to $50 an hour, you can say, that's, that's nice. I understand why you wanted to do that. Now, let's think about what would happen. If we did this, if members of Congress did this, we'd, have, we'd save ourselves a lot of trouble because a lot of economic policies have been tried. We actually know the effects. And so that's the sort of dilemma. We, in some ways, we have to distinguish our moral evaluation or the moral life and our, the internal and external from these economic evaluations. If anything, our good intentions can be a decoy that distracts us from focusing on the effects of our action in economics. Now, there's a lot of really depressing examples of the piety myth at work, but let me give you just one brief example. Before I do that, I'm going to do my Marcus, Marco Rubio uh, imitation here real quick. It's, and when you're from Seattle, uh, Denver is really, really dry. Child labor law. Now, it's very hard to get a kind of robust debate about child labor among members of Congress. It's sort of treated as a universal bad thing. So much so that in 1992, Senator Tom Harkin introduced a bill called the Child Labor Deterrence Act, which would set up a series of conditions in which uh, we essentially stipulated American-style child labor laws on our trading partners. And the reason is because Americans started seeing pictures of so-called sweatshops uh, in the third world, especially in Asian countries, in which you see fairly young children working long hours in what we would consider to be unsafe conditions. And people didn't like that. They didn't want their Nike shoes to have been made in a sweatshop by a child in Bangladesh or something like that. Well, what's funny about the Child Labor Deterrence Act is Harkin proposed it at different times. It never actually became law fully. But the mere threat of it actually led to a change of policies uh, both by governments and by companies. One famous example is a rug company that bought lots and lots of rugs from Nepal that found out that these, many of these rugs were, were made by children, at least partially, and so they quit buying rugs from Nepal altogether. And so you could think of this as kind of the effects, not of the law, we don't know how bad the effects of the law would be, this is just the effects of the threat of the law. And what's interesting about this is that you might think, okay, well, if all of a sudden factories say, we're, we're going to have a hard time selling stuff in the United States if kids are uh, working in our factories, right? So they're going to fire them or, or let them go. Um, that, you know, that would, in some ways, it would sort of fulfill what was the initial intention of the law itself, get kids out of these sweatshops. What's interesting, though, is that UNICEF actually did one of its few really valuable studies, I think, in 1997 on the world state of the child, and they studied uh, these attempts to ban child labor in developing countries. And what they discovered was quite startling. The first thing they found is that about 50,000 kids, they thought, had been removed from primarily the garment industry in the intervening years just from the informal implementation of the Child Labor Deterrence Act. So in a sense, it worked. 50,000 fewer kids are in, in these textile factories. But, of course, here, remember, if we learn the art of economics, you need to ask, okay, that sounds nice, but then what will happen? Did this set of conditions in which these kids were, were forced out of the factories, did that change their economic condition? Right? Did they suddenly get a free scholarship to the country day school? No. Uh, the reality is, is that if children in uh, third world countries are working, it's largely because of economic necessity. And so if you pr forbid them from doing one job, the economic necessity is still there, and they'll, so they'll do something else. And what the UNICEF study discovered is that these children that were previously in the garment industry had overwhelmingly shifted to stone crushing, street hustling, and prostitution. Right now, no member of Congress, and certainly no business leader that kind of implemented these policies informally imagined that. Let's drive these kids out of the shirt factories and into the brothels. But that's the cost of the piety myth. 
of focusing on our good intentions for doing something rather than on the intended and unintended consequences of that action. It's absolutely devastating. In fact, it can very often do the opposite of what we intend to do. Well, the, the second myth really deals with, in many ways, the key objection right now to the free enterprise system, which is that it generates inequality. Some people make a lot more than other people. There's a kind of huge range of people all the way from minimum wage all the way up to people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And people find that, often they find it morally troubling. I mean, here's a picture of a guy from Occupy Wall Street, which I followed carefully, and I'm not sure if this was a guy, I need to look this up, but there's one guy that was quite vocal at Occupy Wall Street, and he was mad because he'd gotten a master's degree in puppetry and, and gotten a lot of student loans, and was having a hard time finding a job that would help him pay the loans, and so this is obviously a result of injustice, and so he, he joined the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, but a lot of people thought, well, you know, there's something to this, right? Now, what if it's the case that whenever somebody gets rich, it requires that somebody else get poor? Right? If that were true, then there would seem to be something kind of morally unsavory about economic inequality in a free economy. Because with you winning, it's like a poker game. If you win, somebody else had to lose, or checkers, or chess. That's called a zero-sum or win-lose game. And a win-lose or zero-sum game is just any game in which the logic of the rules requires that there be both a winner and a loser. These are for most of the games that we play, obviously. But in addition to zero-sum or win-lose games, of course, Logically speaking, there's first lose-lose games, right? Lose-lose games would just be any game in which the participants, those that play it, all end up worse off as a result of having played it uh, rather than if they hadn't. But if you've got win-lose or zero-sum and lose-lose games, you know there's a third possibility here, right? And it's win-win. And a win-win game is just any game in which the participants that play over time end up better off than they would have been if they hadn't played. Now, that doesn't mean everybody ends up equally well off. It simply means that what we say, if you're playing a win-win game, what you do is you say, you compare yourself in that situation with yourself in the counterfactual situation. In other words, you say, am I better off as a result of having played this game than not? So imagine you go into a house and you play some kind of game and everybody leaves, and some people leave with $100 more than they came with, some 1,000, some 10,000. That's a win-win game, even though the outcomes are unequal, okay? So the question is, is every economy a lose-lose, or what most people think, if they haven't thought about it, a win-loser zero-sum game, or is it a win-win game? And what's interesting is this is a really important question because it's an economic question, but the answer to the question really shapes how we evaluate uh, the sort of morality of a free market system, and it's actually based on a particular economic assumption that we make. Now, I actually learned the answer uh, to this question uh, when I was in the sixth grade, actually, in a public school in Texas. Now, I didn't figure out the economic lesson until I was 40, but I did play the game then. Uh, in Amarillo, you know, we often would get ice storms in the middle of winter, 70 degrees one day, ice storm the next day, but we knew they were coming from New Mexico and Colorado, and so on this particular day, the teacher had anticipated that, and during recess, she passed out these toys to all of us students. And imagine a classroom is five rows of five. That sort of keeps it simple. And so she handed out a different little toy to every kid. It's so clearly all had sort of been bought at the dollar section of a store or something like that. Same basic cost, but different. So you got the paddle ball, Barbie trading cards, 10 packs of Wrigley's gum, silly putty and stuff like that. So you passed them out. So now look around at what you have and what everybody else has and write down on a piece of paper how much you like what you got. If you don't like it at all, it's a one. If you love it, it's a 10. But just sort of give it whatever score you want. So we all did that. Then she had us call out our scores one by one. She added up the total and she wrote it on the board. Right? So it's the sort of sum of our evaluation of how much we liked our situation. She said, okay, now in the first round of the game, you can freely trade with anyone else that's in your row. Now the freely trade there is kind of a technical term. It doesn't mean that I can threaten the little girl behind me with torment if she doesn't give me the silly putty, right? A, a free trade is gonna be one in which you agree to it and the person you trade agrees to it freely. 
All right, and we knew that implicitly, right? The teacher is there. We know that, okay, threats probably and stealing are not gonna work here, right? And so that meant sometimes trades happened, sometimes they didn't. But a lot of kids did trade at least once, even when they just had four other trading partners. So that was just a couple of minutes long that settled down, no more trades. She said, okay, now score the thing you have in your hand between one and 10. We all did it uh, between one and 10. She had us call out our numbers. She added up the total and wrote it on the board. And if you're paying attention, and maybe if you know the story, you know what happened. The number went up. Now, remember this, because this is one of the greatest mysteries in the universe, I'm convinced. It's a very strange thing. Nothing new was added to the system, right? The toys were added at the beginning. Now, in the second round of the game, she said, now you can freely trade with anyone else in the room. Right? So that means we all had 24 potential trading partners the first time, and many times you can make multiple trades. And so you can imagine the pandemonium of trades that results, right? The kid that hadn't spoken all year, all of a sudden he's doing these complicated calculations, you know, to <laughs> multiple trades and everything. So that went on for a long time. This is why I remember the event is because I think of this, this particular part of it. Finally settled down and said, okay, now grade what you have in your hand between one and 10. Uh, and so we did that. And again, we called out our, our individual scores, which she added up, wrote on the board. And you know what happened? The number went way, way up. Now, what's going on here? This is, this is strange, isn't it? I mean, nothing new is being added to the system, and yet virtually everyone in the classroom perceives him or herself as better off as a result of having played this game. What exactly is going on? What's going on is that the game, by the very logic of the rules, is win-win. Notice that the students, they, they couldn't just do whatever they wanted to do, right? So that the strong can prey on the weak, like the, like the Lord of the Flies, you know, the schoolboys in the Lord of the Flies, or the big kids end up lording it over the small kids. There was a rule of law. It was a basic rule of law that prevented us certainly from killing or defrauding or stealing or threatening, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, it wasn't anarchy. But when you get this basic rule of law, then you get a series of conditions in which when people engage in free exchanges, they almost never do it unless they perceive themselves as better off as a result. So whenever you go into the grocery store, it's not the same as playing poker, right? You don't go in and do a hand with the grocer and if you lose, you give him his money and leave, right? You walk in with your money and you leave with groceries and he's there and he starts with groceries and he gets the money. That means you both wanted that rather than the thing you had before. So by definition, it sort of channels our activity in terms of economic exchanges into win-win exchanges. So what that means is that when uh, a trade is truly free, when you've really got the conditions for free exchange, by definition, the logic of the rules is that it's gonna be win-win. And most of the examples we think of, uh, of in economic injustices in business, usually involve some violation of the freedom of the trade. Now here's the core point of my talk, especially for the subject this morning. A lot of people think, well, okay, yeah, free enterprise or capitalism, that's, that, that's great, but it needs to be tempered because it's, you know, humans are sinful and so the government needs to have a lot of power. But yeah, socialism doesn't work. You don't want the government owning everything. So we need some kind of third way in the middle. Well, if you understand economics, you realize that Socialism doesn't work, it distorts the market. And so if it, dis you know, it distorts the market royally, it's not like, well, let's just add a little distortion and it'll help, right? It doesn't make any sense. And in fact, it's a false dichotomy. Because if you think about sort of human social possibilities, you've kind of got the spectrum, the extremes would be something like anarchy, on the one hand, which doesn't usually exist for very long, and statism on the other, in which the government more or less controls every decision, including every economic decision. Those are the real extremes. Free enterprise is the condition in which you've got rule of law, so you've got a state that is a government strong enough to enforce the rule of law, but not so strong and big as to violate it itself. When you get that series of conditions, then you get the conditions for free exchange, and that's free enterprise. So you see how free enterprise is actually the real golden mean between extremes. It's not some uh, chimerical middle way between socialism and capitalism. And that's, it's honestly, this is, this is the sort of point of my, my talk today. Let me give you one last myth. Uh, it might sound like it's exactly the same as the zero-sum game myth, but um, my background is philosophy and so I sometimes make more distinctions than I should, but I think this is a slightly different myth, and so I call it the materialist myth. The materialist myth 
is believing that wealth isn't created, it's merely transferred. It's like breadcrumbs on a table. You can move them around from one person to the other, but you don't get more breadcrumbs. <clears throat> you can really think of the materialist myth as the idea that wealth is some finite fixed amount of physical stuff. It's gold or it's land or you know, money or something like that. And there's only so much of that stuff to go around. It's a pot of gold. Some people get there uh, too early. They get more than their fair share and some people are left with the scraps. The best way to think of this, of course, traditionally is in terms of a pie. You know, the very nature of a pie is that if you've got sort of seven friends coming over to join you for your cherry pie and you, you know, they see you cutting it, what are you gonna do? You're gonna make sure to cut the pieces equally, right? You're gonna distribute them equally because if you decide to eat a quarter of the pie, right, everybody else gets a smaller slice. So if you do wanna eat a quarter of the pie, what do you do? You do it before they get there and then you slice up the pieces, right? <laughs> So you've got a physical manifestation of a zero-sum game. But this is really, this is a belief not about trade, but it's a belief about the nature of wealth. Now, it might seem obvious. This is absurd. I mean, who actually believes that this is what uh, it's certainly a free economy would be like? We know that even with recessions and financial crises, over time, economies grow. Even the people at the bottom 10% over time in free economies do better off than their parents. And so we know that happens. We know economies grow and economies that trade with each other grow. But nevertheless, this is kind of one of these grounding metaphors that gets embedded in our heads somewhere. And it shapes how we evaluate economic questions, even when we don't realize it. So you hear, hear people say, so-and-so got more than his fair share. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, right? There's this just a fixed amount of pie. Somebody got too big of a slice. And if you think that, you can kind of see why you might get the idea that it's sort of in everyone's benefit for the government normally to spread the wealth around, to kind of redistribute it so that it's evenly divided, right? So the very policy presupposes what is actually a false economic idea. And we know it's false. What's sad is that even if you think this is kind of a childish or childlike example, in the 20th century, half the human race languaged under an economic system that was based upon this idea. And this is, is from Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto. In this little book, I encourage you all to read it if you haven't read it. He gives you sort of 10, th 10 sort of ways on the road to socialism, and we've implemented all nine or 10 already, so it's a little depressing. Uh, but Marx's argument's essentially that capitalism will sow the seeds of its own destruction. In other words, what they said is that you've got the bourgeois, the capitalists, these are the people that own the means of production, the factory owners, right? And they're the green here in, in this particular uh, uh, diagram. So you've got the, so let's say 20% are the capitalists in this case. And then you've got a bunch of laborers, and laborers are the people that you hire and you pay wages, maybe hourly or some kind of salary, in order to produce something for you. And so you do that, let's say I'm a, you know, I own a, a shirt factory, I hire people, I pay them to make the shirts, and then I sell them on the market. And what I hope to do is to sell them for more than the cost of production, right? Because if I do, then I make profit. Now Marx thought, I believed in something called the labor theory of value, which we now know has got to be wrong. And so he thought something was only worth as much as it took to produce it. And so if you charge somebody more than that, you're exploiting them. And so Marx called this profit uh, surplus value. All right, but what's funny is he said, now capitalists don't squander their, their earnings normally. A, a capitalist will reinvest it in his equipment. And so now he makes the workers even more productive than they were before. So he doesn't have to have as many workers. He can fire some. He can pay the, the ones that he has lower wages and they make more shirts uh, with less money. And then you go out and you can sell it and make even more profit and then reinvest it into your equipment. And this process continues over time so that what happens if you're to look at economy over time, the total amount of the wealth in the economy slowly or quickly gets transferred from those few capitalists, the few and shrinking number of capitalists because they all tend to be monopolists, right, um, to the vast uh, uh, proletariat horde, the sort of 99% versus the 1%. And so here's Marx's prediction of what would happen. This doesn't represent how the number of people. This represents the amount of wealth held by the classes. So notice, remember, think of the green as, this could be 10 people, right, over time. And you eventually get to something like this, right? And 99%, let's say, or 90% of the wealth is controlled 
by the capitalists. And see that little red there? Those are the laborers. They have, it's a huge segment of the population has actually very little wealth. And so Marx and Engels said, at this point, you'll get a revolution, obviously, in which the people will confiscate the means of production, uh, sort of liquidate the capitalists normally, and then the state will temporarily own property and the means of production on behalf of the people. And that will usher in a temporary stage called socialism, which I think looks like this, if you're going to diagram it. Um, but people often don't know if they haven't studied Marxism, is that Marx thought this was a temporary stage. That you have the sto socialism stage for a while, and uh, people get used to not owning things, essentially. And so you create the new socialist man, and then the state withers away, and you get a communist utopia uh, in which milk and honey flow in the streets, and you can fish in the morning, and read in the afternoons, and smoke in the evenings, and everybody does what they want to do. That's, that's the claim, all right? So uh, notice that he had a, Marx has a creation event, he has a fall, and he has a consummation here. Well, in reality, of course, all these socialist experiments got stuck at the socialist stage. And of course, there's a reason for that. And the reason is that the whole theory was clearly flawed. It failed to account for and accommodate economic reality. The economic reality for Marx in England, while he was writing the Communist Manifesto a few miles away, there were factories in which the wages of the workers were going up rather than down. Now, in Marx's theory, that's impossible. So it's a sort of refutation of his claim. We all know that that's true though, right? Even though, you know, we experience it every day even if we forget it. A market reality is over time the pie grows. I know you're thinking this is the best PowerPoint I've ever seen. Wow, <laughs> it's actually just a bunch of slides where I blew it up one after the other. Um, but, but you get the idea here. Now this matters economically, but it matters morally. It's extremely important to understand this because what it means is that in a free economy, somebody can get fabulously wealthy, not by taking it from someone else, but by creating wealth for themselves and for others. The late Steve Jobs, he did not get rich stealing iPhones from homeless people that then he sold for a profit, right? He created these things or he participated. There's really millions of people involved in creating the things that benefited and then all of us in some ways benefit from that. That's the nature of the free economy, is that it grows, the pie grows. And so your evaluation of economic inequality is different if you realize the pie is growing than if you think that it stays the same. Now here's, the, I think, one of the sort of most interesting things, because I, I've spent most of the time here saying that if, if you're a person of faith and you're a Christian, you need to take on board some economic realities that we discover in the economic realm. Some of these you could find in scripture. The idea of uh, private property is embedded. It's two of the Ten Commandments assume that it's true. Uh, and so there are a lot of the sort of preconditions for this, but there's a lot of stuff we've just sort of discovered over time about economic reality. And we discovered that free economies allow people to create large amounts of wealth. And it's here, I think, that theology has something to say to economics. Because if you think of this, if you're a Christian or a Jew or you believe that human beings are made in the image of God, God is, the, the, of course, the supreme free and creative agent who calls the world into existence out of nothing. We're not creators like that. We're sub-creators, as J.R.R. Tolkien said. Thomas Aquinas, a medieval theologian, said, God grants even to creatures the dignity of causality. So he doesn't hoard it to himself. He creates the world. He creates things like sand. God creates sand. He leaves it to us to make fiber optic cables and integrated circuits that are based on sand. That's the idea. And so that is certainly, I think, the, the, the supreme virtue of the free enterprise system is it's the system, the only system, that can channel our appetites, can channel our behaviors because of the rule of law, and can channel our creative ingenuity so that we can create wealth for ourselves and others. And I think that is a, a I hope you find that to be a hopeful realization that the moral case for free enterprise is robust and conclusive. Thank you very much. <laughs>